Hi, I'm Casey Berg with Compassion Kombucha. Uh, my wife and I started this business a little over three years ago and uh, we've been selling at farmers markets here in Central Oregon and uh, for, for two or three years now restaurants through uh, sales of kegs and, and we call wholesale distribution. And this year we're starting bottling. So look for us at your favorite coffee shop. Um, we're uh, up at back porch on york drive there northwest crossing we're uh, over at uh, lone pine if you've been down there they have a great coffee shop um, too many places to name now but we're excited to kind of be spreading throughout central oregon and i'll kind of start off by asking you um how do you begin brewing kombucha did how did i begin brewing i began brewing kombucha probably in about 12 12 years ago when uh, my wife was having some digestional health issues. So she started brewing it and then when she got pregnant, she decided that she wasn't, didn't want to drink it anymore. So I had to take over the production. And uh, ever since then, she appreciated me doing all the work and she just gets to enjoy the beverage. So um, that's where things have landed and we've been just kind of grow, growing our production each year and um, initially started with just sharing with friends and family and then at some point we said this is a pain washing so many bottles let's buy some kegs and you know grew from there um so what is it who, sh who should i be looking at the camera okay and then we'll just at the when you guys are done going through the questions if you want to just do an introduction of like your company like, oh yeah because it the camera it just won't pick up him introducing the yeah. company so. okay but we'll do that at the end yeah. So, uh, so what does your typical day look like? I understand that you're not the traditional brewer. Like yeah. Kombucha yeah. Enthusiast. Well, I started working at OSU Cascades uh, just before the new campus opened and uh, helped set up our parking systems and all of our transportation options, which after COVID seemed fairly minimal. But at one point it was uh, definitely keeping me pretty busy. And uh, um Basically, I come and do some work in the kitchen here, and we have a couple other employees that work with us and help us here um, in the evenings and weekends. So in the summer, when we're busiest, um, I'm in here a couple nights a week and um, coming in on Saturdays for farmer's markets and, and doing things like that. But I have uh, three small kids at home, and so I do my best to try and minimize the number of hours here, but there is quite a bit of work to do. and. Uh, being a small startup, we're really tr trying to be cost effective and keep our costs down. So you talked a little bit about like you're kind of expanding currently and uh, trying to grow a little bit and you are doing a little bit. So how, how many batches of kombucha or what's your quantity of kombucha you produce on a given time frame? Yeah. Can I like show with this or should I just focus on the camera here um, and then talk about it later? Well, I could probably just turn around. <laughs> okay. Um, for our production process right now, up till this point, has been pretty small. And we have some small, um, anywhere between 7 and 25 gallon pots that we produce our kombucha in. So small batch or, or like nano <laughs> brewing style. Um, but I'm pretty excited that we've uh, recently acquired a couple larger fermenters. This one can hold around 300 gallons and I've got a, another one of those. So they're twins. I was pretty excited to get those from Falling Sky Brewing, buying some used equipment here within the state. And um, so the goal is that we're brewing uh, a batch of that every other week and it takes about 14 to 20 days to mature. So it's fermenting in there, that's the primary ferment. And then the secondary ferment, we would still use some smaller pots and we would transfer the kombucha into those pots and add fruit. So our process, which kind of distinguishes ourselves from other competitors is that we're only using whole organic fruit to flavor. And so we're adding that into these pots with the kombucha. We give it a couple more days and let that fruit um, kind of infuse its flavor and then uh, strain it out into kegs and from there carbonate it in the kegs and uh, distribute. My next question for you is um, how is your kombucha connected to Loki? You talked a little bit about the fruit, but like what, what other things connect you to the local bend? Yeah, 
Um, well, we're trying to use as many local products as we can, particularly with the fruit um, flavoring. Uh, let's see, we're using some blueberries that we just got from Berkey's Organic Blueberries over in Corvallis. Pretty excited about that. He was selling them here at the Ben Farmer's Market. And so we got to see that he had a really good product. Um, other than that, we're just trying to source our other fruit um, here within the state, getting a lot of those out of Hood River, like apples and peaches um, and watermelon out of Hermiston. That's always the hot spot for watermelon. Um, of course, raspberries out of Oregon and Washington and um, of course, strawberries as well. We live in a great state for fruit. <laughs> Um, yeah. yeah, so what is one of the biggest problems you run into in producing kombucha? We don't really have one big problem. We have uh, evolving problems. Um, I think that's just what any startup business would experience. So when, it, when we first got started, it was how do we, you know, we didn't have enough pots and we needed to increase capacity or the production. Um, and then we ended up, you know, affording more of those and then we're short on kegs so it's buying more of those and so for us it's just kind of this you know ladder somewhat of uh, continually investing in what we have the least of at that point um, so like I said with a bigger fermenter our capacity shouldn't be an issue for the next you know year but I just put an order in today for some more kegs because we'll have more product and nothing to distribute them in um, and uh, up until COVID we actually hadn't done any bottling so I'd say actually one of the good things of COVID for us is that we were able to obtain a little bottling machine um, from a, a company that was going out of business. So um, that was our, our fortunate uh, situation to be in, to be able to buy that. And that really helped us grow. That was a big constraint of ours being, we, before that we only distributed in kegs to restaurants and now we're able to bottle and um, start putting those bottles out to more locations around Central Oregon. Um, so you talked about a little bit about the different foods you have, but what is your, your personal favorite kombucha to make or consume, or uh, what's your favorite kombucha to make that you guys make? One of our best flavors that we've been making really since we started selling commercially is a raspberry ginger. And uh, my, my brother and his kids always uh, request that flavor whenever they get some kombucha. And I think that's a good, there's a good reason for that. Um, but we've also done a unique flavor, which is elderberry. And elderberry is considered a super fruit. And um, a lot of people take an elderberry tonic. They'll take a tablespoon a day kind of as a nutritional uh, boost or a immune boost. So we've been putting that into kombucha and that's a really unique flavor that we offer. Nice. Um, what efforts have you been making or are making to be like environmentally friendly to? Yeah. Um, one way that we've been, you know, trying to be environmentally friendly is reusing some of our bottles and selling at farmers markets in larger bottles that people can bring back and, and trade in. So, uh, if I had one here, I'd grab a flip top, but, um, yeah, we, we got growlers right behind the camera and, and other things. But, you know, our first couple years at the farmer's markets, we were actually taking kegs out there, keeping them on ice and filling growlers for people that they would bring. So you bring your hydro flask, we fill it up. So minimizing, um, you know, we'll say waste through that. Um, with COVID, we've had to bottle everything. And so we're, now we're just kind of swapping out for people. So they bring back their empty bottles. We bring them back here and wash them, which is a bit time consuming, but um, again, I think it's something that our customers appreciate and, and one way that we can minimize our impact on landfills. Our first step is that we boil water and I just got this barrel um, so I can boil about 100 gallons at a time. And so then we'll transfer, so we'll boil the water, steep the tea, and then we'll add sugar because fermentation requires sugar. It's kind of like fuel. And so we actually use a mix of black and green teas. I think it provides a good balance of flavor. Um, transfer that, it'll be a pretty concentrated sweet tea, something like you'd get in Tennessee. And we'll put that into the larger fermenter and uh, 
and then we put in a starter sco SCOBY, which is a symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast. And this include audio? Yeah. Okay. Um, so SCOBY is a symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast. We'll add that to this fermenter along with a little bit of fermented kombucha to kind of really give it a kickstart and let it sit in there again two to three weeks um, until we kind of get that right mix. We try and let it ferment long enough so that most of the sugars are consumed. Um, that's a healthier beverage for all of us. And uh, the longer it ferments, the more probiotics, other B vitamins and, and uh, other good things, uh, amino acids and things. Pro yeah, I already said probiotics, but other things you're getting. Um, so then we're going to transfer from the fermenter into some smaller pots and uh, my goal is to just use the larger pots, about 14 gallons, and each of these has a valve so it makes it really easy to then transfer, I'm sorry, we add fruit to the pots and then once it's um, kind of infused its flavor, we strain out the fruit and we put, we put it into kegs from there. So it's called forced carbonation, we use beverage grade CO2 to carbonate in kegs. And if we were really had everything together, had more space, had more money to pipe in, um, <laughs> basically ch chill some larger tanks, we'd have something that looks like that. In your brewery tours, you probably saw some bright tanks. So your bright tank is allowing that product to be chilled in a large, larger volume. Um, I have one of those tanks, but I don't have the, um, the piping and everything to bring that. Um, in and install it here. So that's our hope to actually kind of move into our own space in the next year where we can have things more set up. As you will see, we're kind of uh, fit, fit in here with, it, with another company that's producing other fermented products and uh, sharing with them and making as much efficient use of the space as we can. Mm -hmm. That's where the pallet wraps come in, try and stack things more often. Um, yeah, so after we keg it, we're distributing in kegs, but also bottling. So we got a, this is my, my most recent toy. And uh, this is, this is a micro bottler. And uh, all right, so the, our bottler is, is probably something in between hand bottling, just filling every bottle and capping them by hand versus going to um, like a full auto, fully automated system like a lot of the local breweries would have. And they might have a canner, but we're gonna go into bottles first. Um, so we basically will fill this little tote with four bottles and uh, then slide it through here where it just initially will stop. And then once it's on, this, these four pistons drop into our bottles. And the nice thing about this uh, bottler is that it's uh, got a counter, um, counter pressure so all that carbonation that we've built up in our kegs, we don't want to lose that in the process of bottling. We want that to come through to the customer. So this actually seals on the top of the bottle and injects um, CO2, also beverage grade CO2, kind of under the top. So as the liquid's filling from the bottom up, there's pressure on the top of that liquid so that the air bubbles basically don't come out of the liquid. Then you get a big foamy head at the top of the kombucha. Um, which would delay our process to fill the bottle uh, and you'd lose the, you know, that carbonation that we just spent time uh, putting into the product. And then uh, this is the capper, so it'll, once they're full, we'll slide them over, put the caps on there and this thing drops down and, and spins them tight. Um, the last little guy on here is the micro rinse, I call it the car wash, because you'll spill, you'll spill some kombucha, it'll be a little sticky, this thing um, washes and, and blows them dry. And then we package them up and, and send them out. So that's a pretty, I, I honestly, it's my most favorite activity to be doing because it's like <laughs> mm -hmm. everything's come to fruition, um, products ready to go, and next thing you know, we're putting it in your hands. 